I'd like now to introduce Louisa to you, uh, uh, to say a few words about yourself, a really interesting uh, history and background, I have to say. Uh, and then uh, we'll do, uh, I'll do an introductory prayer. So Marisa, would you like to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I'm an eco-artist. Um, I started off in Pakistan, where I was born. And then I spent some time in West Africa as a child. And uh, London for many years. And now down in Bournemouth, where I have an allotment at the end of my garden, which is really, really handy. A greenhouse where I tend to grow from seed because we can get some harsh frosts down here, which kill everything off if I put them in the ground. And, um, and I've got an art studio where I last year was painting some of the, the plants and the insects. And we're looking forward to seeing some of that shortly. Um, and uh, some fantastic uh, art and, well, I'm not going to uh, 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 preempt that. You uh, were keen that we start and we just do the prayer of St. Francis, Marisa. So uh, if we just uh, still ourselves, it's a very well-known prayer, but it is by a man who was so committed to nature. So if we just like to still ourselves a moment, a moment. and I will and pray I will that. Pray that. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Whether it's sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled Wait, as to console. Out. See what comes up. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It's in pardoning that we're pardoned. And it is in dying that we're born to eternal life. Amen. Very good. So um, with that, I think we should, Marisa, we should go on and talk through your presentation and what you are going to share with us today. So um, this is um, about well, it's really a personal history of my allotment and how I've taken it over and run it. And um, I think that if you have an organic allotment, it encourages insects, gets you healthy and helps the environment. And I think that if we all had allotments or communal gardens and grew some of our own food, we could move from a high to a low carbon footprint. I've used lockdown, the last lockdown, the first one we had as an opportunity to grow some beautiful plants and to make the allotment the focus for my artwork. I've done various um, art workshops on Zoom for, for other groups using the allotments as a focus for art. Uh, but I, I also like eating the produce and and um, want to encourage others to have one. And I've, I've saved some of the seeds from different years. And that's why the Monsanto genetically modified seeds, I believe are not, are not um, they're sterile. So if they're sold to poor farmers in third world countries, they have to keep buying them, they can't save them. And uh, I'm also very interested in the idea of crop rotation because unless we move over to permaculture, uh, many groups, uh, the yeah, um, UN, Soil Association, Compassion and World Farming, 
to advise that our soil will fail within 60 years worldwide. Uh, so um, crop rotation is an old fashioned idea that we used to use until ICI decided to dump chemicals on them. So we could move to the next slide. Now this is a diagram of my allotment, well our, my family's allotment, and um, it was very, very wild and full of rubbish when we took it over, but in a way it was good because it meant it was basically organic. And organic farming uses different vegetable groups to practice crop rotation that minimizes diseases. And you can see I've used from the um, book that's in the bibliography on organic farming, there are, there are different groups of, of vegetables so that um, you can sort of change them around each year. Uh, and I made a mandela, which is another permaculture idea. So you step in to the different keyholes. It makes it more interesting than, um, than straight rows. Okay, so next slide. This is how I mapped out the mandala. We've had to clear the cooch grass. I did try and smother it with old carpets, but it didn't get rid of it. Cooch grass is, is, um, will survive a nuclear war, I think. But uh, I've mapped out the mandala and we've cleared the, the cooch grass and got it ready to plant into. Next slide. Right, so allotments are a great way to stagger growth of produce to ensure seasonal eating and lower food miles. Now I start the seeds in the greenhouse and this year I'm going to stagger it. So I have several plantings during the year and my family helps me plant them out. And I put down biological killers called nematodes a week before I plant out the seedlings and you have to water them every day, uh, which then they eat the slugs while the seedlings are small. And I also keep all plain packaging, wool, cotton, and all green and vegetable waste for composting and mulching. And you can also ask your neighbors for their hedge cuttings or grass cuttings or Amazon. <laughs> it's better if it doesn't have ink on it, but Amazon packaging it seems to be very good. And I'm going to have a system of water butts down there this year and some piping to help reduce our water consumption as the summers are heating up. And I'm hoping that will that will lessen how much water I have to get from the from the pipe we have on the allotment. Okay, so uh, next slide. Here's the early sections of vegetables growing in the mandala. You can see the shape of the mandala just about. We've got broad beans. Now I have to say broad beans are really good if you harvest them when they're very young and use them in stir fries, just chop them up or throw them in whole um, before they turn into big beans. Um, if you're not so keen on them once they get older, uh, but they are on my allotment, they were the most successful source of protein I got last year because we had a very couple of really hot spells that killed off the runner beans. I've also got turnips, potatoes, and cucumbers coming up there. So next slide. That's um, Abby helping with the fog ponds. She comes and helps me with my parrots. I've inherited parrots, and she's studying animal management. So she, she um, braids the parrots and also helps clear out the fog ponds, which we use in, as well as the nematodes to 
to not have to use slug and snail pellets. And I've also got lots of slow worms and they live under an old carpet that we let, we, we found them under there. So we've just left the carpet and thrown compost on top. So um, next slide. This is a little clip of some frogs swimming, swimming in the pond, if it works. You can try and play it. It's trying, it's trying. It worked perfectly when we did our uh, little, uh, here we go, let me try again. We did our tr trial, it worked absolutely brilliantly. So I'm afraid to say it doesn't they seem to have frozen. It's thinking. Oh, well, never mind. They, they were all swimming around happily, different sized frogs. And I've got loads of frog spawn in the ponds at the moment. And one frog was showing an appearance. So we could go on to the next slide. This is the back of the allotment. Uh, there's an old shed that I may um, replace. We might put more of a summer housey type shed there that will be good for my grandson. And there's a lovely tree I inherited, a cianthus. And um, I got these, this um, canoe, which we were going to mend for the family on free cycle, but we never did. And then I discovered the winter before last, frogs were living in it. So we moved it into the allotment. So I've now got three frog ponds. I think it's quite sort of artistic, the blue of the tree and the blue of the canoe. And the slow worms are under that old carpet in the front. We can go on to the next slide. That's a sketch I did from the swimming frogs. That's just a little watercolour. Next slide. So last summer we had globe artichokes and buddleia. The globe artichokes are like great structural plants. I don't actually eat them, I leave them to the bees. Uh, and the buddleia, they clothed in insects. Uh, butterflies and bees and lots more and you can see the whole list of we grew so many vegetables I mean we were having bucketfuls of vegetables and fruits and we gave some to friends and we were very healthy from eating them for the last six months I've still got some um, sprouts and leeks left from last year and this year we'll intersperse wildflowers and I plan to build a herb spiral. That's mentioned in Gaia's Garden, one of the books in the bibliography. Okay, next slide. There's a picture uh, at the very far end is a tiny dot of a friend of mine. We did the, the, um, butterfly count that a butterfly society was asking people to do. She drove down from Salisbury to me at Bournemouth when we were allowed to do such things and came into my allotment to do it with me. We're counting butterflies for half an hour or so. The globe artichokes in the front, they really are beautiful plants. I really recommend them. Okay, next slide. There they are, close up. Globe artichokes and buddleia. Next slide. Uh, there they are again. And at the back, you can see all the vegetables are coming up nicely now, except for the runner beans. <laughs> okay, next slide. Right now, plant, plant protein. I also did a paper to help Stefan with um, something we gave to the Environment Committee about plant protein. And I planted peas, runner beans, and broad beans. 
and mostly it was the broad beans. I had masses of them, but the others weren't so successful. So we use the early beans whole, as I've already mentioned. And this year we're going to phase the planting of seeds. So we get the vegetables lasting throughout the season. We sort of had a few gluts last year. So friends were getting bucketfuls landing on their doorsteps. <laughs> but I still hope to do that. And our local allotment society also have a system whereby you can put extra produce on a table there once a week and they collect it to give to people that need it. So we can cut our carbon footprint this way because apparently 90% of vegetables and fruit are currently imported. And you know, I mean, that's, that's just incredibly wasteful. And I also grow comfrey as this gives vitamin B12. My daughter's vegan and you can often miss that in vegan diets. We can go on to the next slide now. Now there's a bee covered in pollen. Next slide. We can move to the next slide. Thank you. There they are, being very busy. And they're on the uh, globe artichokes. Next slide. That's my sketch of them. And another slide. There we are. Next slide. So I'm moving towards a system of permaculture that's explained in great detail in the book Gaia's Garden. This is a system of not digging the soil, but instead layering different mulches that rot down and improve the soil without the release of carbon from digging. Well, first of all, we had to dig out the pooch grass, but it didn't work. <laughs> and then what we did was we put down some volcanic ash that I can buy at my allotment society shop. And then um, limestone, it's a sort of white thing for the brassica patches, but not the others. And then straw, I got a load of straw on free cycle from someone who's giving it away. And then um, cardboard. And then uh, compost on top. Or actually the cardboard went before the, the straw so that it rots down and that stops the weeds coming through. And um, usually I go to a chap who's got horses for the for the compost but this year it was difficult with the virus so the allotment society has someone that brings it over from their local farm with a whole load of that and spread it and what I'm trying to do now is I'm growing red clover into it because I want to try and avoid the cooch grass coming back so I put down red clover seeds and fenugreek seeds. Uh, and I'll see if we strim those. I've got, a, got myself a battery powered strimmer. And if you strim them to keep them short, then they don't grow up and the roots become too difficult to grow into. And I'll, I'll report back whether that works. And then if agriculture went back to this techniques, we would retain a lot of carbon and replenish the soil, and ICI would have to find another use for its chemicals. So, so next slide. There's, that's a little herb called borage that uh, grows on the allotment and a little bee. Next slide. There's a peacock butterfly sketch. One I did for another and an art group workshop. Okay, next slide. 
microbiomes. We had a lecture from the local science museum on microbiomes and in the bibliography there should be a link for this but uh, they are something that you absorb from an organic allotment or garden to and they go into the gut and keep us healthy and um, we can cut down on illnesses this way so it's good exercise we're absorbing microbiomes and i really want to encourage schools to have an allotment each and um i know people would say that in in cities it may be impossible but in the bibliography there's a few links to schools that are having allotments in in london and also um one of my friends and one of my daughter's friends she lives in a in a block of flats with two small children and she got herself an allotment so all through the pandemic she's really had like a garden to take her children to so anybody can actually ask for an allotment and the local authority has to give you one i think by law but there's lots of links about that in the bibliography and of course it's a very good exercise uh, both physical and mental and uh, in the bibliography as well, there's a lot more about helping to find communities in London. Ethnic minorities can grow exotic vegetables instead of flying them in. And again, helping, helping people to connect and also helping to lower the carbon footprint. So next slide. There's the broccoli. slide. Now those are, um, they are courgettes at first and if you leave them they grow into marrows so you can do a bit of both. Next slide. Well, so they are busy growing. Next slide. You can see they've engulfed the canoe and the tree they really took over we had loads and loads of them next slide tomatoes had loads of tomatoes i um in the end i i had to pulp them uh and and freeze them because we had so many we couldn't eat them all next slide This is the bibliography. This, um, the organic allotment I found very helpful. And it's got the groups of vegetables that you can use to do crop rotation with and lots of helpful ideas. And Gaia's Garden has the idea of the Mandela uh, sheet mulching, which really could, sheet mulching just by itself could save the planet. It's an amazing concept that we really need to do. And I'm going to do a herb spiral as well this year. And we can go to the next um, slide. Yes, those are all different uh, sites to look at to get more information. Uh, next slide. Yes, these are... Yes, a little quote from William Wordsworth. Laying out grounds may be considered a liberal art in some sort of like poetry and painting. And it really was making the Mandela. It was like making a work of art in itself. And that's, that's um, more about the um, school in Camberwell that has an allotment and how good it is for urban kids. You know, they can grow the plants and then they can, and then they can eat them. Um, and, and also everyone from many different minorities can also uh, join in. Next slide. 
Yeah, this is about um, uh, more about that, but um, but um, all the kinds of vegetables that can be grown here, that that um, that don't need to be flown in, and also there was a quote that's not actually in there, but there's a quote from my my other reference notes about how uh, Cornell University has discovered that children will eat vegetables if there are six different colors on the plate. So, you know, if they're going to grow their own vegetables and make a colorful plate, they hopefully will also eat them. And we can have a whole generation of children growing up who have had an allotment and have learned to appreciate food and where it comes from. Okay. So yes, I think that's that's the end of the, the bibliography. And uh, back to you, Stefan. Thank you very much for that. That was uh, fascinating and for taking the time to take the pictures uh, and, all, and all those slides. What would be really great would be to just hear people's perspectives and questions. So either stick your hand up uh, or your virtual hand or real hand and, um, and let's hear it. Okay, uh, that's Sue uh, with a real hand, that's fine. So you need to go off mute um, and then uh, away you go. I have an allotment here in Ealing, West London, um, and I've been growing organically for the last um, seven, eight years, I suppose. Um, we have our paths that separate the plots are all laid down with cooch grass, so they need careful um, management. In fact, I find not too difficult with, with a strimmer, but it, it does have to be regular. Our particular problem, though, with perennial weeds, a bindweed, it's it's invasive, it's perennial, it's very, very stubborn, and you only have to leave that much in the ground and it, it uh, spreads. And it actually loves being in composts and uh, doesn't rot down. So, <laughs> so um, even just putting um, thick layers of carpet and things all over your plot forever, um, isn't going to get rid of it unless you simply don't want to grow anything on the ground. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody else has any um, ha has any solution to that sort of a problem. Um, I'd need gallons of nematodes to uh, kill that little lot off. Well, actually, it wouldn't kill the um, bindweed. It might kill the slugs. Um, but one of my uh, allotment deer. Uh, friends who's been there for about 30 or more years just says well plant some for yourself and some for the slugs and we get round it that way there's always enough to go round. <laughs> okay so, any more for, yeah thank you any more for any more there um is that Peter did I put you put a hand up you need to unmute or press the space bar yeah, actually, I, I didn't put my hand up, but I might as well say something um, <laughs> myself. Yeah, I have I have had an allotment for 20 years. I share um, the last person's thing with the, the cooch grass. We've never managed to get rid of it. I, I did once hear that um, if you, that tomato plants have, uh, and marigolds, sort of, um, what shall I say? Um, companion planting. Yeah, companion planting. I mean, the... African marigold or something called I mean oh, I've forgotten the names but they they can actually discourage the the coach grass to grow and I also read somewhere that um they sell it in Italy because it's regarded as a delicacy or I don't know the details of that the other thing is I I can't succeed to get frogs anymore I've got a pond at home and um we got a success with newts and they seem to get, if, if there are any frogs spawn laid, the, the newts get there first. <laughs> anyway, I've, I have made a pond on my allotment and I'm hoping to see if frog spawn might arrive there this year for the first time. Yeah, anyhow, thank you. Thank you. Barbara. 
frogs have been having great fun in my pond the last 48 hours. We've gone from the ice so thick on the pond on the south coast I couldn't break it last weekend to, to spring. And they've just, the, the pond has been heaving. But I too have newts. And last year, the, fro the frogs, the, little, the, the, tap, the, the frog spawn, were, they were eaten at the frog spawn stage. Whether it's the newts or the magpies, I'm not sure. But this year, at least they've got a lot more frogs in on the act and there's a lot more spawn there. So I'm hoping that some of it will get through. I think they are a really good way of, of control, you know, they, they are good for slugs and that too, aren't they? As long as they stay around in your garden. I think that's the other thing, you've got to have vegetation and such like to encourage them to stay over the summer months. So they're there when the slugs get busy. Any more thoughts? Okay, Helena. You're mute, you need to unmute. One of the most popular phrases in Zoom yeah. times. Okay. So, um, I'm into my second year of, of an allotment. I have had them in the past and I took this one on with my son who, um, even though he's in his late 20s, has shown a remarkable lack of interest in any of the hard work. So I've done most of it. Um, but I was really interested in the idea of, of the community, the allotment community, because I live on my own and I quite wanted that, um, you know, somebody to share an interest in gardening, because I do my own, I've got my own garden that, you know, you end up doing on your own. But the, so that the allotment is quite friendly and they have a coffee morning, but it's on a Sunday morning, which is of course the worst time for <laughs> for most Christians isn't it because you're in church and I haven't quite got my head around I mean at the moment they're not meeting anyway because of Covid but once hopefully that opens up again I'm gonna have to try and find a way of matching find, finding that kind of door into the allotment community as well as you know keeping up my other things so yeah well, thank you for that um, an observation uh, no good, uh, good as an important observation yeah. with so many things you know uh, I'm now going to just go to, uh, unless Marisa, you want to come in, I'm going to go to Debbie, who's uh, put her virtual hand up. Thank you. And you need to unmute as well. Or press the space bar. Yes. Very inter interested. I, I, I love your descriptions, Marisa. Um, I, I, I'm on my fourth year of allotmenting and uh, uh, dealing with matters of cooch grass and, and, and the like. Um, I have heard that nematodes are tremendously effective but awfully expensive. Uh, have you discovered any, uh, any ways of getting them uh, economically um, uh, anywhere? Uh, and also, what, what other companion plants, apart from the ones mentioned already, have, uh, have people uh, found helpful? Because I grew some companion plants successfully last year, but only one or two sorts. Shall I, shall I come back and answer a few of these things? Absolutely. Uh, you have the, uh, you have the, the the floor for not just those things, but anything that uh, that comes to you. All right. Well, with bindweed and cooch grass, I think um, I keep the cooch grass down with a strimmer around the allotment, and because I've got the mandela pattern. I tend to use sort of straw or uh, chip bark for the paths in, inside the Mandela keyhole. I think otherwise you have to dig it out, the bindweed and the cooch grass. You'll never get rid of it otherwise, but don't try and compost it yourself. Collect it in sacks and when you have enough sacks then take it to the dump or get a friend to take it to the dump when they're open and because they they compost at a much higher temperature with um with green waste and they will get rid of it for you uh i don't think companion planting will get rid of it or keep it away uh i also will let you know if if this permaculture idea of trying 
to grow the um, red clover will solve the problem of it coming back because the red clover and fenugreek and winter tares or tars, however they're pronounced as well, I'm going to put down next next winter on my vegetable patch, the winter tares. And um, I will see if I can plant into those and if they stop the cooch grass or bindweed coming back and I'll, I'll report back. But according to Gaia's garden, it should. And I, I have to do something because some of my allotment neighbours are a little lazy. Well, she's a lovely old lady next to me and she can't really manage hers and I can't really help her as well as mine and my artwork. And when her cooch grass flowers, it just blows into my allotment. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I, I've got to find a way of, of keeping it at bay. So I will see if having a, a green manure of red clover and fenugreek and others will stop it, will crowd it out so it can't take over again. I like that idea very much and I, I would like to grow fenugreek for its own sake because I like cooking with it. <laughs> it's great in dal, um, if you Isn't make dal it's very sort of, yeah. Uh, and yeah I, I, make a lot of curries so together yeah. with coriander together they are marriage made in heaven aren't they yeah. yes mm. now as to newts and frogs i mean i would suggest maybe taking some of the frog spawn out and rearing it in a little um well kitchen tub or something or if you have a i've got a i've actually got a small aquarium which i put my parrot chicks in when I take them away from their parents because if I'm going to find homes for them I have to take them away from the parents which is very traumatic but um, otherwise they're completely unmanageable um, so um, I'd suggest taking some of the frog spawn out and rearing it separately maybe and then putting it back later if the newts are eating them all but that's just a thought um, uh, right, the size of frog ponds. Well, I think that my biggest one is the most successful. My husband and my grandson dug it and it's three foot deep at the deepest point, which was recommended to help keep the frogs alive during very bad weather. You know, when it froze over, it's supposed to stop them freezing. And there certainly is sign of life and frog spawn on that big one. And I haven't seen on the two others, but usually they migrate from the big pond, which is about, I suppose it's about four foot by three foot and three foot deep at the deepest end. And the others are smaller and one's a canoe. So, um, so that's the size of it. Now, um, I, our allotment society, when they're open, they're open on a Saturday and a Sunday morning from 10 until 12. So I could only suggest that you'd offer to host it on a Saturday. Uh, that you, you would be there or you could have a rotor of people that, would, that could open it up on a Saturday morning. And we sell all kinds of seeds and volcanic ash and mesh and steaks and and uh, well until all this happened some wonderful members used to make the most amazing cakes <laughs> which uh, well I suppose my waistline has um, recovered a bit from not having so yeah I mean that would be possibly what a solution to the Sunday morning opening now, nematodes, I get a 10% discount on everything I get from having joined the Organic Gardening Catalog Company, which is listed, I think it's to do with the book, uh, and uh, you could just put it in onto Google, and if you join, then you get a 10% discount on seeds and everything. But nematodes are expensive, and... Um, 
if you can get out first thing in the morning to your allotment and grab all the slugs and snails, we have a system whereby we collect them all um, and, and one of us takes them and puts them out in the woods every few days. <laughs> we don't like to kill them. <laughs> So that that's what we were that's what we were doing because I put my nematodes down this year and then we had such a drought that I think they died even with watering them. So if you know that you're going to have a wet week with the weather forecast and you're a week before you plant out, then yeah, put them down. But otherwise, just use going out first thing in the morning, collecting them all putting them into a container with some green stuff. And if you go for a walk, just releasing them somewhere where no one will mind. Uh, let's see, I think that's, I think I've answered all the questions. Any more? Or feel free just to discuss or make points. You know, uh, there aren't too many of us today. It works well, Debbie. Hi, Marisa. Um I'm a quite new allotment holder and um, I'm quite impressed that you are managing to use seeds from previous years. Um, at the moment I, I buy all mine and I just wondered if, if you do manage to do that for all your plants or if you sometimes have to buy some of them and um, also which, which plants do you think are easy for doing that because I would like to give it a go. Um, so what would you recommend starting with? Um, so what would you recommend starting with? Okay. Anybody else? Okay, well, um, the ones that have been the most successful have been broad beans and courgettes, marrows, um, and beetroots. I've got loads of them. And that's again why it's important that Monsanto can't keep selling the GM seeds because it's it's really bankrupting poor farmers. Uh, now um, I do also buy some because I I don't know whether always they will survive. But those that I don't use, I keep in a tin, and I use again the next year. Uh, so those, and, and our local Friends of the Earth are considering starting a seed bank. And I think that would be a seed share so that if I've got loads of seeds and I can't plant them all, we could sort of maybe meet or put them up or maybe I could get my allotment society to host a seed share so that we can grab seeds we don't have and give seeds we have too many of and I, I, th I think that's a very important thing and could, could be very very useful especially for um, people who just scraped up the money for the allotment and don't have a lot of money for seeds and, and everything. Peter? On, on seed saving we try and do it quite a lot at home, my wife and I, Ruth. I found tomato seeds do, um, you can save them very well, cut them when you've got a nice tomato at the end of the season then save the seeds, dry them and then use them again and runner beans and French beans, that kind of thing. But because you mentioned going into permaculture, which I also try and do as well, you're trying to buy, to use um, like um, perennial plants as well. So you you mentioned that the um, globe artichokes, and you showed lovely pictures of them. Uh, they're really nice. I I've got I've got right next to me here is my seed sowing program for the year, and I just happen to have I got some grow globe artichoke seeds, and they they're growing very well. So I'm very pleased. It's the first time I've tried to do that, and I and I I also like you buy seeds from. Garden Organic, which I'm a member of, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of other things that, um, one thing uh, um, is that, I don't know if you've heard of poached egg plant. 
it's it's um it's supposed to be one of the very early flowering um plants it's, its technical name is Lamanthe douglas and i allow that to sort of grow rampant on my plot um so it 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 has it flowers early so it attracts bees and things like that and supposed to encourage um the right insects at that time of the year um and things like comfrey and and borage like you showed the the borage and things like that and uh, the the other thing i i'm doing with cooch grass which i've been doing it for a few years now is i have a, a water butt and i drown the cooch grass in there and then when i feel it's it's dead after six months i then put it on the compost heap and i personally feel that has worked for me yeah thank you thank you very much yes that, that's very useful thank you yes yes i also um harvest the comfrey and put it in a water butt with rainwater and let it rot down and it makes really good tomato feed that's great now gainer the uh, putting the hand up work didn't it it got you at the top of our screens um can i ask about crop rotation so you put your beans here and then can you just outline crop rotation? What follows what? Please. I think you could put that slide up again with the diagram, Stefan. Now they are in, in that book, but you will also, I think if you Google crop rotation, you will get either this one or other ones. So group one are cucumbers, tomatoes, potatoes and squash. There might be more in that group but those are the ones that I had grown from seed. We get potatoes, we get seed potatoes from our allotment society and I've also kept some of those from last year. And group two are beans, peas, leeks and onions. So you can see I'm going to have to move them all round one this next year. And then the group three is turnips, cabbage, cauliflower, kale and broccoli. Now that group I'm not going to move because I've got a, I inherited an iron structure that I think is beyond me to, to move. So um, I'm going to hope for the best and plant again into that group. But it has had all winter to to um, lay fallow and it's got a lot of lime on it and compost and and stuff so because I can easily cover that with with some old um, webbing I got one well, mesh from the allotment society I got it quite cheaply from them someone was getting rid of theirs so I got it a bit holy needs mending but manages so I'm going to keep that group where they are but I'll move the last group group four which is chard beetroot spinach and spinach beet now I've already got a lot of chard from last year that is perennial and I've got more that was I grew last year in the greenhouse that is ready to plant out uh, so it will just be the beetroot and I'm tr going to try parsnip for the first time this next year. Uh, so that's that's the last group. So um, I think there are actually five groups altogether, but I only got four groups. So you just move them all around each year and you should be OK to stop um, crop diseases. Now, I'm just looking at the time. We have a commitment to finish and let you all go after one hour, uh, although we don't mind the conversation carrying on, but we'll, we'll finish formally at that point. So is there any sort of last kind of burning question that people would like to put uh, or comment they'd like to make before we start to wrap things up? doesn't look like it so um let us finish with the blessing of saint francis of assisi to brother leo 
I'm going to put you all on mute while I do that. The Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and have mercy. May he turn his heart to you and give you peace. The Lord bless you.